Top of the morning to you, church. That sounded a lot better in my head, I promise. No, I mean, thanks Patty's Day is never on a Sunday, so I just had to do it once. Hey, it's good to see you. Thank you so much for being here for our worship service. Will you stand and we worship a risen Savior? He's alive, church. There's no other God that can claim that fact. So let's sing about that this morning. and my shame and he left it in the grave. Sing about that. You took all of our shame and you left it in the grave. We're forgiven. We're forgiven. The work forever done only by the blood it is finished. So go
be seated. Hey, good morning, church. I'm Brandon. I'm the uh, college and career young adult ministry uh, leader here at Lebanon. Um, just want to say good morning. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, if you're a first-time guest with us this morning, I want to ask you to do one thing. One thing only, um, look at the back of the pew in front of you where you can find either a QR code uh, or a paper copy of a Connect card. Um, if you'd fill that out, uh, just give us a little bit of information. I promise you we're not going to spam your, your email. We're, we're not going to send you a bunch of phone calls. Uh, but if you'd take that and go see um, at the end of the service one of our welcome team members, we'd like to give you a little gift just to say thank you for being here. And maybe ask how we can pray for you, how we can get you connected uh, with Lebanon. And then, if you're a regular attender or uh, one of our members, uh, just want to remind you that you can continue to worship uh, this morning through your giving of, of your tithes and offerings um, here. And you can do that a couple different ways. You can do that. You can drop it in the box in the Welcome Center, uh, or you can go to our website, lbcnow.org forward slash give. Um, and go there. It'll have a link send you over to uh, Church Center where you can give there super easy online. Uh, just two announcements this morning. That's all I got. Um, just a reminder, next Saturday uh, is the Churchwide Fellowship and the Students versus Adults basketball game. This is a fundraiser so that we can send our youth uh, to camp this summer, help reduce that cost. Um, so if you want to come see some healthy maybe aggressive competition between the students and the adults, uh, you need to go ahead and register. So go ahead and get registered this week. You can do it right now. You won't offend me. Pull out your phone. Register right now. Uh, it'll cost 10 bucks per adult, 6 bucks per kid. Um, and also, we're doing an uh, Italian-themed cook-off. Um, and if you register for that, it's 15 bucks, but that covers your entrance into the game. And we'll, uh, we'll judge a couple different categories, see who's got the best Italian dish. Um, and if you're not uh, competing uh, in, in the cook-off or whatever, we just ask that you bring some finger foods, enough for your family uh, and some to share. Uh, and then our, our next announcement is um, Good Friday. Come with us, 7 p.m., right here. Uh, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together, um, remembering Christ's uh, sacrifice for us in our place as we look forward to Resurrection Sunday. Um, it'll just be a sweet time of worship uh, together as, as we remember uh, Christ our King. If you'll stand with me, I want to read from 1 John chapter 4 as we go back into singing and worshiping the Lord. I just want to remind you, 1 John chapter verses 9 and 10 it says in this the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him in this in this is love not that we have loved God but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propiti propitiation for our sins church God reached out to us first in love bringing his son to us to pay for our sins on the cross. Remember that as we return to worship. Let's pray for us. God, we just thank you for your goodness in, in, in loving us so much that you sent your son to come to earth to walk in our mess along beside of us. God, and then to die a sinless, to live a sinless life and live or uh, die in our place for us, to pay the penalty of our sins that we could not pay. God, we thank you, God, and because of that, we worship you. God, I ask that you be with us this morning. Uh, fill us with your spirit. Be with Matt as he brings a sermon. God, just clear his mind of all the distractions, God, and just speak through him as your mouthpiece. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Will you sing this with us? Man, let's worship and praise God for the love that he bestows upon I've got a friend Closer than a brother There is no judgment Oh, how he loves me I've got a friend He is my strength He is my portion With me in the valley 
with me in the fire, with me in the storm. With all my life, testify, hallelujah, we're not alone. God really loves us. God really this verse from Romans as we continue on this theme of love. Romans 5, starting in verse 6, it says this, for while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to even die. Catch this. 
but God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Verse 10 says, for if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. So much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Church, let's praise him for that love.
God, we stand before you today in all of your love. Or as much as, as my human self, as much as we try to wrap our mind around the extent of your love, we'll never be able to. The fact, God, that you were willing to sacrifice your son for me. Knowing everything that I would do. Knowing how I would fall short. But that didn't stop you from sending your son for us. From extending a love like we will never know from anywhere else except from you. So God, I praise you for your love. Lord, I thank you for the fact that we can rest in you. That you're a God that lives and a God that is reliable. That when the seas rage, when the wind blow, when the uncertainty of life hits us, there is a constant figure. There is a place that we can rest, that we can lean on. And that's you, God. God, I praise you for that fact. Lord, we want to know you better. We want to hear from you. So God, as your word is proclaimed, may we hear truth today. God, be with us in every aspect of this service. May your name be glorified. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us, church. You may be seated. Good morning. As a diehard Carolina fan, it was all I could do to pull myself together to be here today. I seriously contemplated canceling church. I thought I saw snow in the forecast somewhere in the United States today. Uh, you have to give, you do have to give. Some credit to NC State, what a long run, what a long run they made in the tournament this year to win that last night, five straight games. Um, they played really well, played out of their heads. Um, I don't know how they did it. I thought for sure they would wear down at some point and break down, but they managed to pull out the victory. And so for all of you NC State fans, congratulations. The average uh, age in the United States is 38 years of age, so over half the country is not old enough to really remember the last time NC State won <laughs> an ACC championship, being 37 years ago. So y'all enjoy. Uh, when Jeff Rail and Nate Cockman walked by me during the first song, I threw up a bit in my mouth with all of the NC State stuff they were wearing. <clears throat> But it got me reflecting. Of course, I was too upset to go to bed right away last night, and so I did a little bit of research and want to begin today's message with a little segment I'm calling Back in 1987. <laughs> Back in 1987, when NC State won their last ACC championship, gas was 90 cents a gallon. You could buy eggs for 78 cents a dozen. Wow, right? The average home price was just over $100,000 compared to today, where the average in America is $417,000. In 1987, no one had internet in their homes because the World Wide Web wasn't even available to the public yet. Nokia introduced its first ever cellular mobile phone, and it looked something like this. What you're maybe more familiar with are those bag phones that you had to carry around and plug in your... That didn't even come out yet. Wasn't even out yet. The most popular car bought in America was this beautiful Ford Escort. <laughs> Went brand new for just under $7,000. If you were a little bit larger family, you would have enjoyed this beautiful Chevy Astro minivan for a price of about 10000 <clears throat> For crying out loud, Taylor Swift had not even been born yet. <laughs> However, already at the age of 44, 
Joe Biden would announce his first run for U.S. president in 1987. You can look it up. <laughs> Turn to Mark chapter 14 today. We got to get into the scripture. Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. <laughs> <clears throat> Mark chapter 14. <laughs> All right. <laughs> if you don't have a Bible, you'll find Mark 14 in the uh, Pew Bible. There are Bibles in the back of the Pew in front of you. If you don't have one, I encourage you to take one. Mark 14, you'll find it on the Pew in the Pew Bible. On page 1012, we'll be starting in verse 53 in just a moment. I've titled today's message, Self-Denial or Self-Defense. Probably uh, another title that would serve well for this would be, A Tale of Two Trials. A Tale of Two Trials. Um... We are now at the last chapter in Jesus' life. Um, we are at the most difficult time that he will experience. Last week he was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, agonizing over the coming judgment of God and wrath of God that would be poured out for sin on Jesus, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God, Son of God. And Jesus, knowing what awaited him, was agonizing there in the garden. His disciples were told to watch and encouraged to pray, and three times he came and found them sleeping instead, and then he was arrested. One of his very own, one of the twelve, Judas, who Mark highlights for us, describing as one of the twelve, again, uh, Judas comes and betrays Jesus with a kiss, leading them under the cover of darkness, leading the scribes and the Sanhedrin and the religious rulers of the nation of Israel, leading them under the cover of darkness to where Jesus would be, and then kissing him and betraying him for money. One of his own had turned on him and and he was seized and arrested, and everyone, it says, all, in verse 50 of Mark 14, they all left him and fled. And then it even mentions a young man in verses 51 and 52 that, were, that was kind of following these events as well, and wearing just uh, what he would have slept in, a linen cloth, and and when, when, when they tried to capture him, who was following Jesus, he left everything he was wearing in their hands to get away. And, and Mark is saying to us, here's one who left all and in shame fled. He left all to not follow Jesus. Everyone has gone. Jesus is alone And in verse 53 and following in this chapter, Mark is going to present to us a strong and stark contrast between Peter and Jesus. This is Mark's final sandwich story where he begins a story, interrupts it, tells a whole other story, and then comes back and finishes the first. In fact, both Jesus and Peter face trial here. Watch this, and let's just read the whole text together. It says, and they led Jesus, after he'd been arrested, they led Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter had followed him. Well, this is interesting. Peter is, is kind of following this isn't this a good thing? Doesn't Mark present being a disciple as one who follows Jesus? But notice how it's described. He followed him at a distance. 
Hmm. Right into the courtyard of the high priest. This would have been at his home. And, and as he, Peter, was sitting with the guards. Here's another interesting phrase. He's following Jesus, but at a distance. But he's not with him. He's with someone else. He is with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this, their testimony did not agree. Stop there for just a moment. What is going on here? They're trying to find some witnesses to accuse Jesus of something that would be worthy of a capital offense so that they could put him to death. After all, that was their motive. That's what they were trying to do. This has been described as a kangaroo court because even in the Jewish court proceedings, they were doing several things illegally here according even to their own law. They were meeting at night. They weren't allowed to do that. They were holding the trial in a private residence. They were not allowed to do that. It should have been held in the temple district and precinct. They were holding it during the week of Passover, again, which was illegal. There were false witnesses that were brought, and their testimony did not agree. That should have done away with the trial right there. Several Jewish laws were being broken in the way in which they were holding this trial and court. And they were accusing Jesus of having said that he would tear down the temple, the one that Herod had built for the Jews, and that he would build another one not made with hands. But Jesus never actually said that. Jesus, in fact, mentioned that the Father would be the one that would destroy the temple. He wasn't saying that he would necessarily do that. When he did publicly speak of a temple being destroyed and being rebuilt, he was speaking of his own body and his death, burial, and resurrection. So the high priest is kind of in a difficult spot here. He's trying to get Jesus accused of something worthy of capital punishment. Everything's going poorly. Now he steps in, much like a flamboyant attorney in a courtroom setting would come out to the public. And verse 60, the high priest stood up in the midst And asked Jesus, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. (laughs) It fulfills prophecy that speaks of Jesus' silence in his trial and accusations. But why does Jesus need to give an answer for testimony that Everyone can see he doesn't agree and doesn't match and is false. He doesn't need to answer that. He was silent at the first accusations. He's silent again even when he's asked about it. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the blessed? The word blessed here is Kind of a weird way of the high priest avoiding speaking the name of Yahweh, but a term used to refer to Yahweh. Kind of ironic that he's sort of trying to follow some sort of procedure here when none of the others have been been followed. But, But he's basically asking Jesus, are you the Messiah, the anointed one? Are you the Son of God? And Jesus said, and this is such a clear, plain answer, I am. Jesus in answering this so clearly knew, he knew that this would condemn him to death. He said, I am, but he went further. He didn't just stop there. He said, you, plural, speaking to everyone in the room. He said, I am, and you all will see the Son of Man, a term that refers back to Daniel 7, verses 10 through 14. You will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power. And most translations capitalize that word power 
because he's clearly speaking about the Father and he's speaking of the throne room in heaven. He's speaking of a place of equality with the Father. You will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. So he's saying he'll be seated in a divine position. He'll return one day coming in the clouds of heaven. A divine vehicle will transport him. There is no ambiguity about this. Jesus is clearly considering himself equal with God, the Son of God, the one who has all the power of God. (laughs) So the high priest immediately, he had what he needed now. He tore his garments and said, what further witnesses do we need? You have heard this blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him. Some began to spit on him and and to cover his face and to strike him. Jesus, by the way, in Mark 10, 34, he had prophesied that this would happen to him, that he would be hit, that he would be spit upon. They began to spit on him. They began to cover his face and to strike him, saying, prophesy, you know, who hit you? Other gospel writers, Matthew and Luke, give us a little bit more detail about what's going on here. But they're hitting him in the face and they're saying, prophesy, tell us who hit you. And the guards received him with blows. Interestingly enough, Mark now is going to answer that in his colorful way of writing. He is going to answer that um, challenge for Jesus to prophesy by recounting now what happens with Peter that Jesus had prophesied about earlier would happen. So if we wonder if Jesus has the power and authority to know who's hitting him, to prophesy about events that have yet happened, he's about to record what Jesus had already said would happen and show us how it does happen. So he is going to answer that accusation with the acknowledgement that Jesus has that power. Now verse 66, back to the beginning part about Peter And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with the Nazarene, Jesus. By the way, that's a good accusation for for Peter to be able to have made of of him. (laughs) You know, one of the things that Mark tells us a disciple is, is one who is with Jesus one who is with Jesus. Jesus, when he called the disciples, he appointed them and he called them apostles so that they might be with him. Here's a girl saying, hey, hey, you have been with him. That's that's a good accusation. Verse 68, but he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway. He moves now a little bit further away. And the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him and began saying, she began again to say to the bystanders, this man is one of them. But again, he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. In fact, there is even in that swearing a hint in the original that he is cursing the name of Jesus even. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time, and Peter, here's Mark connecting the dots for us that Jesus can prophesy. Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. What Mark is doing in 
the telling of these two trials, in essence, one of Jesus and, and one of Peter, and the way in which he is presenting it to us as one of these sandwich stories of his, he's doing it to provide a strong and stark contrast between Peter and the way that Peter responded in the midst of his trial, where he was questioned, and the way Jesus responded in the midst of his trial and the way he answered when he was questioned. Uh, Jesus is the one who denies himself while Peter is the one who denies his master. Uh, Jesus didn't have to say anything. He was being uh, accused and false witnesses were being brought in and it was pretty obvious this wasn't going well for the high priest. And so Jesus wasn't saying anything. Could he have defended himself? Could he have said, no, that charge that you're leveling against me, saying that I said I would destroy the temple? I didn't say that. Could he have defended himself? Could he have preserved his life? Could he have even remained silent and avoided death? But no, when he was asked if he was the Christ, the Son of the Blessed, he answered in a way that he knew would not lead to self-preservation. He knew that it would lead only to his death, and yet he denied himself while Peter at the same time is right nearby denying his master. Jesus remains faithful to the Father. Peter in this scene is unfaithful to Jesus. Jesus is bold and truthful in his testimony of his identity. All the while, Peter is cowardly and lies about his identity. You may want to notice there in verse 71, I didn't mention it or highlight it when we were reading through it, but in verse 71, the third time Peter denies there with the bystanders, he, he, he invokes a curse on himself and he swears and he says, I do not know this man. I do not know this man, is what Peter says of Jesus. Peter could not have, that, at that moment, he could not have uttered words that were more deceitful and untrue and at the same time more truthful. It's really a form of irony here in his own words. I do not know this man. Yes, he does. Yes, he knows Jesus, but does he really know Jesus? Does he really know Jesus? No, because he hasn't discerned Jesus' person. He hasn't understood Jesus' mission. He hasn't embraced Jesus' call to suffering. You see, in Peter saying he doesn't know Jesus, he is speaking truth and deceit at the same time, because in truth there is a sense in which he doesn't know Jesus. One author put it like this, when Peter said, I do not know this man, we are seeing a high form of irony. He knows Jesus, but actually he doesn't. He, along with all of the disciples, appear to have failed in discerning Jesus' person. They have failed to understand and embrace his mission. They have all become unfaithful to Christ at this moment. Let me show you a little chart that kind of puts these two side by side, the outer story of Peter and his trial, if you will, along with the inner story of Jesus in his trial, to just show you how clear it is that Mark is wanting us to consider these together. Uh, by the way, um, you know, some of the others, like Luke, for example, when he tells of this, he just kind of tells us about Peter's denial, then he comes and tells us about the trial. He kind of separates them. Mark weaves them together like this in order for us to consider them at the same time. Um, in both in cases, you have Peter as the protagonist and Jesus in the other. Uh, Peter is free. He is not bound. He is free. Jesus is held captive. Uh, both are mentioned of their location. Peter is outside. Jesus is inside. Both have accusers that are questioning them or accusing them. There are a group of bystanders for Peter's case. There are false witnesses in Jesus' case. There is a slave girl in Peter's case, there is the high priest in Jesus' case. 
All three accusations, both against Jesus and Peter, deal with questions of identity, issues of identity. Peter, are you not the man? Jesus, are you the Christ? Are you the... They deal with issues of identity. In each case, there are three responses. Peter denies, denies, curses and swears. Jesus is silent, silent, then affirms and explains. What results from that? For Peter... He lies and utters falsehoods, and in the result, he is saved. His life is preserved. Jesus tells the truth, is condemned to die. Both fulfill roles of prophecy. Peter fulfills the prophecy Jesus had declared earlier that this very thing would happen, that he would deny him. Jesus fulfills the blindfolded prophet prophecy, both in the Old Testament as well uh, as just his prophecy coming to fruition here right after that. R.T. France, in his commentary, put it like this, the effect, this is a long quote, so you want to take a picture of it, but the effect of this way of telling the story, in contrast to Luke, who records Peter's denial before Jesus' hearing, The effect of this way of telling it is to throw Jesus and Peter into sharp contrast. Each will be under pressure, but whereas Jesus, both in his silence and his final dramatic utterance, will stand firm, Peter will crumble, Jesus will go to his death, but with his witness to his mission undimmed, Peter will escape, but at the cost of his integrity as a disciple of Jesus. As such, it could be expected to offer serious food for thought to Mark's readers as they assessed their own faithfulness and built up their strength for witness in a potentially hostile world. So what is Mark doing with this as he is writing to his audience at that day, Christians who are struggling to remain firm and stand strong in their faith in Christ? He is giving serious food for thought for us, for Christians, for Christians that day, and even for us to build up our strength, to assess our own faithfulness for how we would witness of Christ in a potentially hostile world. In fact, one that would be familiar with this story that would come a little bit later would be a pastor in the town of Smyrna. He would uh, pastor the church of Smyrna in the late first century through the mid uh, half, uh, first half of the second century. His name was Polycarp. Polycarp lived to be about 86 years of age, but this pastor was finally put to a point where he was required to either blaspheme and deny Christ or be killed in the Colosseum. Crowds of evil people were chanting the proconsul there with Polycarp would have asked him to denounce the atheists, which the proconsul believed atheists to be, in the Roman world, believed the Christians to be the atheists because they only believed in one God. They didn't believe in the other God. So those were the Christians were called the atheists in that day. And Polycarp at 86 years of age was was told by the proconsul. In your old age, would you not just spare your life and and die a peaceful death and deny Jesus, denounce the atheists? And he looked at all the evil, wicked people who were chanting for his death and, and denounced all of them as atheists instead. He was threatened with wild beasts, being told that they would let the beast loose to come in and to tear his body apart. He was threatened with fire. To which he said and responded, 86 years I have served him and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? And he was put to death and martyred right there in front of all of those witnesses martyred for the cause of Christ. He would have been familiar with stories like this and reading about this and seeing how Jesus remained firm and confident and strong. And it would have built him up and strengthened him in his faith. Well, here's kind of what I want to do. We only got a few minutes left. I want to just make some application for us today. Is there anything we can do to grow in grace or to strengthen ourselves in a way that will help us to be faithful to Christ? You know, how can we prepare ourselves for the day of trial? Um, For most of us, we're not dealing with or uh, facing moments where our faith is threatened to the point of losing our life. But if we wait until that moment to try to prepare, I'm afraid that we'll fall 
miserably short, much like Peter did. How can we prepare ourselves for the day of trial? Um, Bob Knight, who has a lot of things to be said negative of him, though, who coached Indiana basketball for a long time, though, one of his uh, good quotes that um, I used often as a player uh, trying to motivate our, our players in practice and just encourage the rest of the team to, to work hard in practice. Bob Knight used to say, everyone has the will to win, but few have the will to prepare to win. Uh, the preparation comes in practice, in practice. How do we prepare ourselves for the moment of testing or trial? How do we prepare ourselves or strengthen ourselves to be faithful to Christ, is there anything we can do to grow in that kind of grace? Well, in this scene, in this story, two points can be made right away. One is that Mark is presenting this to us in such a way that not to deny ourselves is to deny Jesus. You so say, what does that mean? Peter would not deny his own safety. He would, den- he would not deny himself the protection and the comfort. And so in doing that, he denies Christ. And, and what Mark is doing is presenting to us a little bit of an equivalency here. Not to deny yourself. We don't talk about this a lot. We are, we are consumers today. Everybody say, we are consumers We are consumers today. We consume. We don't deny. We don't go without. We don't withhold from ourselves good things that we could take that are no sin. We we don't know. But what Mark is presenting to us is this the importance of self-denial. Jesus could have preserved his own physical body. He could have saved himself from this occasion, but he didn't. Peter, on the other hand, does. Put more positively, it would look like this. When your faith is under trial, self-denial minus self-defense is faithfulness to Jesus. Self-denial without self-defense is faithfulness to Jesus. We have Jesus who does not defend himself. All the while, Peter is defending himself. Jesus is speaking truthfully. And not defending himself. Peter is speaking lies in order to defend himself. Your faith might be facing some kind of trial today. Maybe not the same as like a polycarp being brought into an arena and threatened with death. Maybe not Peter. Maybe not the same kind of threat that Peter faced. Surely if he concedes and acknowledges that he was with Jesus, that he is one of his disciples, whatever befalls Jesus could likely befall him. He knows that. So he preserves himself. Maybe your faith is not facing that kind of a trial, but maybe it's facing a different kind of trial with family or at work or maybe in a liberal educational institution. It might face trial in those places, where to speak openly about your faith, to speak up about your loyalty and commitment to Jesus Christ and belief in Christ as the only way of salvation. There are some contexts in which maybe with your family, maybe at work, maybe in certain liberal educational institutions here in America, to speak openly and publicly about that would bring some type of difficulty on you. But for most of us living in the West, our faith, our relationship to Christ isn't under attack like Peter's. So what we need to do, and what we ought to learn practically from this scene is that we ought to prepare and practice self-denial before the persecution or trial ever hits. So, for instance, if you can't make a free throw in practice, if you can't make a free throw in practice, we'll, we'll come to that in a minute, but If you can't make a free throw in practice, odds are you won't be able to make it when the game is on the line, right? And even when you can make a free throw in practice, still, when the game is on the line, you could miss. 
Hence the guy for Virginia who was a 90% free throw shooter, missed the front end of the one and one, and NC State goes down and hits a lucky three, banking it in, rolling around, and gets him into the champion. Anyway. <laughs> <clears throat> If you can't make a free throw in practice, odds are you won't make it when the game is on the line. If we can't deny ourselves when it's easier or in preparation and in practice for the moment of testing, if we can't practice and learn self-denial now, odds are we will not stand strong or firm in our faith when the moment of testing and persecution really comes. You know, there is a long history, nearly two millennia, there's a long history of Christians preparing themselves for persecution through self-denial. Sometimes we call this practicing the spiritual disciplines of abstinence, abstaining from certain things, denying ourselves certain things for the purpose of of strengthening our faith and commitment to Christ so that when the testing comes, we'll be more prepared. Only two weeks left until Easter. Still a little bit of time to engage in a, a short season of what's called Lent. Now, typically this begins earlier than now. Lent typically begins on what's called Ash Wednesday, 40 days, not counting Sundays, that lead up to Easter. You say, what in the world is Lent all about? Uh, for many of us as Baptists, we, we've never talked about this kind of stuff. Uh, historically, uh, Baptists haven't been um, real keen on self-denial. But anyway, uh, Lent Lent can be traced all the way back to 325 A.D. where the Council of Nicaea discussed a 40-day Lenten season of fasting. It wasn't long after that that the church adopted this practice as a way to prepare for Good Friday and Easter. And so again, it's typically it begins on Ash Wednesday, 40 days, not counting Sundays, leading up to Easter Sunday. It's often described as a time of preparation and an opportunity to draw closer to God. It is a time for personal reflection that prepares our hearts and minds for Good Friday and for Easter. Three main things, what are called the pillars of Lent. Again, the process of denying yourself something is good practice for when the testing comes. Three main pillars of Lent would be prayer, fasting, and giving. Everybody say prayer, say fasting, say giving. You didn't say giving with as much uh, passion as you said the others, all right? But anyway, those three pillars, prayer, fasting, and giving... Prayer during Lent would focus on our need for God's forgiveness, involves repenting and turning away from our sins and receiving God's mercy and love and just reminding ourselves of that. Time in devotion of prayer during this season leading up to Good Friday and Easter. Fasting involves the giving up of something. It's very common Probably the most often thought of thing when it comes to Lent. You may have heard somebody in the workplace say that maybe is of another denomination or something that's a little more hierarchical or um, a little more denominational. Uh, they would uh, speak of giving up something for Lent. And you might have wondered, what in the world is that all about? Fasting, it's the giving up of something during this season that's a regular part of life to serve as a reminder of Christ's sacrifice. For us. It's a time that you can replace what you would do with more time to connect with God. And then giving, giving money to the church as a way of responding to God's grace and generosity and love with grace and generosity and love towards others. Prayer, fasting, and giving forms of self-denial that can prepare us for when the moment of testing comes. Because if we never prepare, we will not be ready when the day of trial comes. So I would ask you to think about that. There's two weeks. What could you give up for two weeks? What could you give up for two weeks as a form of self-denial 
in order to prepare yourself for when the moment comes when your relationship with Christ is really tested? And the answer for many of us is, we don't do this. We don't think about this. We don't practice self-discipline and self-denial like this. I really want to challenge you to do that. I don't want you to just sit here and listen to this and then go home and not do anything about it. I really want you to think about this. Make a list. What are some things or something that I could give up for the next two weeks as a form of self-denial to prepare myself for when the moment comes when my relationship with Christ is really tested? Oftentimes we think about fasting, we think about what? Food. We think about food. And that's one aspect of it. You know, you, you could say, I'm going to give up certain foods during these next two weeks. Or I'm going to give up lunch. And during lunch, I'm going to pray and I'm going to draw closer to Christ. Or I'm going to give up lunch two days a week over these next two weeks. Or I, I'm going to give up sugar or chocolate or peach cobbler or Girl Scout cookies or or coffee, or, or at least flavored coffee, or, you know, is there something that you could deny yourself that would teach and prepare yourself in drawing closer to Christ? It's not just food that you can go without. Nowadays, we speak of fasting in terms of giving up other things. Social media for the next two weeks. Could you stay off of Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or TikTok. Lift your mood. You say, for the next two weeks, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to just buy something to lift my mood. For some, that may not be a problem at all. For others, it may be a real problem. Or giving up intimacy with your spouse, even, for the next two weeks. 1 Corinthians 7 even mentions that as something that, if both agree upon giving it up, specifically for devoting yourselves to prayer, you could do that. 1 Corinthians 7, it's literally a practical New Testament point. Tim Keller wrote once that counterfeit gods were anything so central and essential to our life that should we lose it, our life would feel hardly worth living. You know, what is something that we could give up? I mean, really, like make a list of some of these things that you think, I could never give that up. I could never. That's become an idol in your life. Uh, our, our boys, they, um, you know, they like to play video games. And so the thing that we discussed a couple weeks ago with them was, um, was giving that up. Now, they only get to play uh, 30 minutes a day, two days a week. That's their limit for video games. Uh, hopefully some kids in here, uh, you know, are, are, hope, are hearing this going, please, please don't, don't do that. But, but we asked them to give up one of those, give up one of those days. So just 30 minutes, one day a week for the season of Lent and during this to try to draw closer to Christ. One author writes about Lent in our contemporary Christian culture where the self is often the focus in our contemporary Christian culture where the self is often the focus of social media posts, of sermons, even of worship songs. How many of our worship songs <laughs> is self the focus? In a contemporary Christian culture where the self is often the focus, Lent steers us to the cross where we contemplate our fallenness, our finiteness, and our frailty. When we stop drinking from the broken cisterns of the world, we gain a heightened awareness that our deep thirst can only be quenched by the living water. Instead of being quick to slap on a temporary fix, whether it is chocolate or the distraction of a television show, fasting helps us understand only it helps us understand only the one true God can meet our needs and quench our thirst. Most of us don't realize how deeply we hunger and thirst for God and how deeply we need Him because anytime we feel a moment of need in our life, we fill it immediately with something else to distract us from our need for God. That's drinking from the broken cisterns of this world, filling us in a shallow way that leaves us thirsty and hungry every, every other day. 
And when we choose to give up that, it drives us closer to our dependency upon Christ. So what could you give up? I would ask you to make a list and come up with something just for the next two weeks at least, and then make that a part of your regular disciplines. I want to close with just a couple quick thoughts. This entire scene toward the end of Mark is really, really disappointing. It's really disappointing. I hope you feel the weight of disappointment in these closing scenes in Mark. I mean, it's disappointing. Peter, the leader of the disciples, fails miserably. No one is there with Jesus. His own rejected him. Rome will torture him. Judas, one of the twelve, has betrayed him. Peter has denied him. Not one of Jesus' friends remains with him. This is a very disappointing part in the Gospel of Mark. Even though last night was disappointing watching that game, I had three of my closest friends, my sons, there with me in the disappointment together. I had another close friend who was texting me as we were going through the disappointment together. I had some members of the religious Sanhedrin who were also texting me. (laughs) But I was not alone in the disappointment. There were friends with me. Jesus is completely abandoned and alone. Peter, the leader and spokesman, has denied him three times. But the note ends in a positive tone because it tells us at the end in verse 72 that Peter broke down and wept. Repentance that leads to confession is God's gracious plan for restoration and renewal. Whatever you may have done in your life this week or this season or years ago, whatever you may have done in failing miserably before your Savior, God's gracious plan of restoration and renewal is available through confession, through repentance that leads to confession. Mark closes this out with a hint that there is hope for Peter. Unlike Judas, Peter breaks down and he weeps over his sin. The last thing that I would say, so I would say on that point, Christian who may have failed miserably, there is hope for you. Repentance and confession is available. But then this last note as well I want to point out is that this scene highlights our absolute need for Jesus' atoning salvation. Our absolute need for the atoning death of Jesus Everyone gets it wrong. Everyone in this scene acts evilly. Peter lies. The religious leaders for, it, for the nation of Israel conjure up false witnesses, do things illegally. Jesus' friends flee from him. No one remains. No one. No one acts rightly. In this, Peter may have shown up at this trial thinking he could do something to save Jesus. He will leave knowing that no one but Christ alone can save. We all need the absolute atoning death of Jesus. No one can save but Christ alone. So if you're here today and you've never put your faith and trust in Christ, if you're watching this online, if you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, you must trust in Jesus. We cannot save ourselves. 
If we were involved in this scene, we would have been just like everyone else in the scene. Christ must save and Christ alone. We all need the atoning, saving work of Jesus Christ. He alone can save. If you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, put your faith and trust in him today. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? With your heads bowed and eyes closed, the worship team is coming to prepare to close us. If you've never put your faith and trust in Christ, I would invite you when we're singing, you could come to the front this morning and I'll, you just kneel around the altar here and I'll, I'll meet with you and pray with you and explain how you can trust in Jesus to be saved today. If you failed miserably and you want to come and confess to, before Christ today, repentance and confession is God's gracious plan of restoration and renewal for you. If you want to come and, and say, God, show me uh, what I should give up in order to deny myself, to prepare myself for a day of testing and trial, come. You can do that today. If you want to just stand and sing and worship Jesus Christ today, do that today. Let's stand. next Sunday. You're dismissed.